Nelson Gary always felt coast to coast was a metaphor for Deeran and Chiba, for stability, which Elliot needed, and disorder, which he also needed. The two were vying for Elliot's affections. When Deeran left, which she needed to do with some regularity, returning home to sign visa papers, Chiba and Elliot hung out, just friends with a mutual sense of growing affection. When she returned, she did so with understandable jealousy. Who was this woman, and what were Elliot's intentions toward her? Deeran was mild-mannered, sweet, kind, and helpful. She did everything she could for Elliot, the two even making efforts to start a foundation for abused children, an enterprise Schoenkopf was also peripherally involved with. But whenever the name Chiba came up, she turned suddenly irate. Occasions when they ran into each other, at shows or bars, devolved into drama. Once, according to Chiba, Deeran called her a fucking whore and accused her of addicting Elliot to heroin. It was an ugly, contentious triangle. Even Elliot's neighbor, Barb Martinez, told Valerie, You've got to move on. She struck Martinez as a little young. The sense was that she was in over her head. She encouraged Elliot. She kept him from being lazy and reclusive, Martinez says, but at the same time it was clear things were not working. Something had to give. It's more evidence of the efforts of Elliot's early relationships, the abandonment by his father, the idyllic interlude when he had his mother to himself for a period of four years, when in his mind they needed no one else to be happy his mother's eventual abandonment of sorts as she remarried and the damaging relationship with Charlie. What evolved for Elliot was a mix of strategies. There was self-sabotage. He ended relationships even when they were good. As he wrote in Go By, he'd leave you even if things were promising. In other words, he preempted relationship failures. He expected them to fail, so he torpedoed them. He cut them off before they reached their inevitable, in his mind, end. Nobody broke your heart, he sang in Alameda. You broke your own. But he also needed love. He hated to be alone. So he sought intimacy as he doubted its viability. In short, he resisted breaking up with anyone, as in the relationship with Bohm, which kept dragging on. And he didn't want to risk being with anyone either, especially in the sense of needing them, coming to depend on them, tying his feelings up with them, and in the process, making himself vulnerable to painful disappointment. Yet finally, through a process not entirely clear, Deeran decided, after many invitations and one email exchange not to be interviewed for this book. Elliot ended things with Valerie. As Chiba put it, he sent her back to Scotland. Martinez recalls her leaving quickly, but in fact she stayed around L.A. for at least a matter of weeks, if not months. Or she left, then quickly returned. And as several people have described in close detail, she seemed to fall apart. She was thrown into what appeared to have been some sort of emotional tailspin, very sad, very unexpected, and very hard to watch. Elliot's feeling, perfectly understandable in light of his own history, was that she did not deserve to be abandoned. But he found he couldn't stay with her either, apparently. She quickly went from being at baseline extremely neat and tidy and well put together, to not bathing, not changing her clothes for days at a time, according to several people who were there to see the regression. More than once she allegedly, and vaguely, threatened Elliot's life, saying, in effect, that something drastic was going to happen, and that she wasn't talking about herself. Elliot, wisely, holed up in a studio he'd recently built with the name New Monkey, in an office complex in the San Fernando Valley. Calls were placed on Elliot's behalf to his psychiatrist, Dr. Schloss, the brain boss with whom Gary Smith had set him up. At times, he and Valerie had met with Schloss together, 
as had Bunny and Ashley and Jennifer Chiba, even Dave McConnell. Clearly his parents knew he was in some degree of trouble emotionally. They also were learning piece by piece the extent and seriousness of his addiction history. At some point, Schloss was told of Deren's condition and asked for advice about what to do. She obviously needed help badly. It was far from clear how things might turn out. Schloss, however, was apparently dismissive. He said he knew Valerie and she couldn't hurt a fly. By this time, she was telling people she was going to win her man back. She was on a mission driven by a monomaniacal mindset, now at a point, some believed, where she'd overstayed her visa. She slipped into shows in strange disguises, wearing white wigs. Those who knew her saw who she was. The fear always was that she might do something desperate. In late January 2003, several months after the breakup, the Get a Backbone episode occurred. This was the message she called out to Elliot in the middle of a performance, another rocky one, right after he finished the song Pretty Ugly Before. She may have believed she would have gone undetected, unidentified, she was in disguise. Yet several people, <clears throat> excuse me, who were there that night positively identified her. And although Elliot did not know at first that Deeran had made the remark, he did the next night when he played the same venue again. What everyone understood was that Valerie needed help. Schloss's demurals aside. They were sympathetic. They didn't demonize her. It was understandable what she was going through. She had devoted her life to Elliot. She'd done all she could to support him, to the degree she knew how. She'd been there when he was at his worst, beset by nightmares in which he beat himself up, in which he kicked his own ass for treating me badly, and recognized he needed to separate drug use from escaping my past, in or stupid, I don't remember what happened, sad in self. The struggle had exhausted her, unhinged her. The result was some form of emotional breakdown. Elliot had deserted her, He'd rejected her perfect love. And it was a decision see, she simply could not and would not accept. Still reeling mentally and physically from the ghastly neurotransmitter restoration, and deciding reasonably that it might not be a good idea to go home, he'd taken to sleeping in a drum isolation chamber in New Monkey. Elliot turned to Chiba. At the time, he was weakened, she says, to the point where he found it hard even to get up. Still, he asked her to meet him at the roost. He told her he'd sent Valerie home, that he had finished up the ten-day treatment, and that he needed somewhere to stay because he could not take care of himself. The two had a natural bond, their histories lined up. Depression, thoughts of suicide, drug use, both legal and illegal. Chiba played music and knew Elliot's catalog inside and out. She was a trained art therapist, too, a counselor with an M.A. from Loyola Marymount, so she had the requisite skills. She was in a position to understand Elliot's psychology and to apprehend the connection between his art and his moods, the role played by imagination in his overall well-being. At first, there was little thought of becoming romantic. They were obviously attracted to each other, but that took a back seat to the main objective. Getting well, trying to find some sort of mental clarity away from drugs, especially crack. As it would be to the last day of his life, paranoia was still present. It kept materializing just as Schoenkopf predicted it might. 
It found a foothold in Elliot's brain, a residue of dopamine hyperactivity. The obsession with DreamWorks was an ongoing consternation, impossible to dismantle. He would tell Chiba, Someone's trying to kill me, you know. While living with Valerie back at the Disney cottages, and even when recording with McConnell in Malibu, all Elliot ever seemed to want to eat was ice cream, double rainbow. It was the same with Chiba. He kept a healthy stock in the freezer. At times, he refused to leave the house to buy it. He pleaded with others to do it for him. Once deprived of food, he passed out and turned blue at the Greek amphitheater. As always, if anyone tried questioning him, attacking, however gently, the irrationality of his beliefs, he'd reply with, What? Even my friends don't believe me now? His ideas were deeply entrenched. Cutting them out through any sort of disputing process seemed mostly hopeless. Other possibly paranoia-related odd behaviors materialized, too. Chiba says he started taking computers and telephones apart and putting the pieces in the refrigerator. As he moved with Chiba to a small home on a hill, at the end of a long drive behind another house out front, and next door to Roger and Mary Steffens, Roger Steffens was a world-renowned reggae expert who maintained a reggae museum. Her feeling, one that others around Elliot shared, was that he was already gone. It was just a shell of him then. It was as if a part of his personality had been removed. He was dulled, mentally muddled, tired, internally besieged. Even his compassion, his vivacity, his concern for others had leaked out invisibly. Naively, but just like most everyone else in Elliot's life, especially women, Chiba thought she could save him. I loved him, she says, but at the same time I wasn't sure I had what it took to stay with someone so fucked up. She did her best. She stuck with it, feeling as if she were doing the world a favor. But it was like three full-time jobs at once. Day and night she was on call, in the back of her mind realizing people are going to do what they are going to do. Her belief, no doubt correct, was that Elliot was definitely insecurely attached. Admirably, he exposed his vulnerability immediately. He was very clear and open about how he felt, yet when it came to relationships he tended to be guarded and unsure, or ambivalent, resistant. He told her succinctly, My childhood made me feel like I didn't exist. I was nothing. What Chiba focused on apart from managing day-to-day needs for nutrition, getting Elliot back to some approximation of physical well-being, was the music, encouraging him to work when he felt up to it. New Monkey was set up. He had begun renting the Van Nuys space back when he lived in the Disney cottages. For a time, he kept equipment in the cottage loft reachable via the circular stairway. It had functioned as his home studio. But he moved all he had to the new space, eventually, its name a hopeful inspiration, making a music a new monkey, a replacement addiction. Once he got it up and running, he spent days at a time there, sometimes sleeping in the same drum isolation room, buying new gear, taking it apart when necessary and doing what he could to fix it. At first it was a total mess, but Elliot and Chiba got it organized. They put inspirational quotes on the board, tapestries on the wall, partly to dampen sound. Drawers and cabinets were painstakingly labeled. 
apart from a Fairchild compressor, which Elliot also really loved. His overriding fixation, one that dominated the last year of his life and became, indeed, a new monkey, was a Trident A-Range mixing board, one of 11 made, the same sort of range the Beatles had used at Abbey Road. Initially, the board was a piece of shit, according to Nelson Geary. When it arrived, it failed to function properly, and Elliot concluded he'd been ripped off. But he tore into it with total absorption, dedicating every free moment to getting it up and running again. Gary calls the board Elliot's second most impairing obsession, the first being DreamWorks. He still was not able to shake the notion that the company was bugging his home, tapping his phone, hiding listening devices in plants in his lawyer's offices. As a sort of accidental treatment, he trained all his attentions on the trident. In Gary's estimation, it was the place he would go as an escape from mad thoughts about DreamWorks, yet it led to circular ruins of despair. There was nothing Elliot failed to comprehend about the board in terms of how it could or could not function. But he wasn't exactly a techie, so no matter how hard he worked to get it repaired, it remained unyielding. The board, Gary believed, was Elliot's new speedball. In his fantasies, he'd picture it by his side as he took a stand against the evil leviathan of the corporate record label. In short, the device made him crazier. He couldn't get his mind off it, but as a symptom, it more or less worked. He'd stopped heroin for good, crack too, and their place in his psyche was taken by the trident. He lived and breathed the maddening thing, but it was a better drug, less destructive, if still bizarrely consuming. The trident was a means to an end, even if Elliot sometimes treated it as an end in itself. The truer focus was the music he'd make with it, the activity it was supposed to serve. Handfuls of songs were scattered about, some old, re rejects from prior efforts, some relatively new, performed but previously unrecorded. It's not clear how much actual recording Elliot got around to at New Monkey. Most people feel very little was laid down on tape there. Not exactly nothing, but not a lot. Yet despite the condition he was in, still physically ravaged, paranoid, now and then secretly abusing Schloss's prescription drugs, intensely fearful of imaginary spying by DreamWorks, he got to the point where he envisioned a double album, a sort of concept album, looser than, say, The Wall, more like Sgt. Pepper's or The Beatles' White Album. By now, he'd cut off McConnell, possibly out of more paranoia, but his intent was unchanged. He wanted something adventurous, edgy, dirty, with songs spiraling off in many directions at once, messy but with an underlying unity, a whole exceeding the sum of its parts. Chiba hired Fritz McCod as a studio assistant, the person heard at the start of King's Crossing. And like a well-meaning taskmaster, she sent Elliot and Fritz off to work. She pushed and prodded. Some days Elliot got almost nothing done. Other days he'd return with tapes and play back what he'd come up with. It was decidedly slow going, but it seemed to be working. In between trips to the studio, Elliot and Chiba indulged in what she called retail therapy. They headed off to Home Depot, Fry's Electronics, the Bodhi Tree bookstore where they bought baskets full of self-help titles. Now and then, on rare occasions, Elliot donned the green goggles, slang for getting stoned. He smoked, Chiba says, to combat Adderall addiction a remedy he felt worked. 
She didn't like it, but it seemed at the time like a, a harmless enough irregularity, and it never led to anything harder. In terms of the music, a total of something like 58 songs awaited refinishing, Chiba recalls. Of those 28 to 30 were to be called. Some were frankly experimental, melodic noise, blind alley, and yay. Some were layered, wall of sound concoctions like Stickman and Coast to Coast. Some were meant to slowly explode after gentle beginnings like Abused. Some featured insane amounts of guitar tracks, Chiba says, along with Motown vocals and drums arrived at by happy accident, such as Shooting Star, a song Chiba says Elliot wanted as an opening track. To be expected, certain numbers were also acoustic. Let's get lost in the comparatively old Memory Lane, about Elliot's Sierra Tucson experience. It was all slowly coalescing. This was to be Elliot's epic, a Homeric statement to exceed all others. The list of tunes expanded almost daily. There were, in addition to those named above, the instrumental See You in Heaven, Mr. Good Morning, From a Poison Well, Here If You Want Me, with lyrics added to an instrumental riff from figure eight. True love, taking a fall, go by, talking to Mary, sons and daughters, going nowhere, and the insouciant but ominous sounding suicide machine, once titled Tiny Time Machine, the tune in which Elliot imagines making a happy home out of hellish things. He rides a pony on a neon night, saying everything will be all right. Chiba says Elliot worked tirelessly on the mixes to get them just the way he wanted. He pushed the limits of the recording equipment using unorthodox setups. He ran the sonic gamut, intrigued by any potential new direction. Even Neil Gust rematerialized, showing up for a short visit at a time when Elliot's paranoia was on the increase, Chiba recalls. The two recorded a song just like back in the heat miser days in Portland. I spent a week and a half with him, Gus says. Elliot brought up the band's demise again, apologizing once more for what had happened. He said he wanted to make another heat miser record, go on tour, kind of crazy, but he was a mess. I was like, you need to get healthy first. As for the recorded song, Chiba can't remember its title or if it ever had one. She later gave the master to Gust. What is indisputable is that the record was set to explode a brand new Elliot Smith with a brand new game. It was to be a colossic artistic departure. All the inimitably nuanced beauty of the prior efforts was retained in songs like Let's Get Lost and Going Nowhere the lyrical weight and density, the intricacy, but the range of sound roamed heedlessly, numbers dropping like deliberately amateurish homemade explosives, creating a corrosiveness never before seen on any other of Elliot's records. Gary believes some of the strain Elliot felt at the time had to do with this change of direction. He knew it wasn't going to jibe, he knew it might unnerve or confuse fans to whom he always felt a degree of devotion. He understood that, on its face, it was a bit of a disorganized tangle, a lot like the White Album, in fact, with its jarring incongruities from Dear Prudence to Revolution 9. But so be it. It was Elliot's Finnegan's Wake, his electrified Beckett. And if DreamWorks detested it, all the better. He was up for a total sonic rebuke, all paranoia aside. The sad question, of course, was whether he could bring it off. Did he still have it in him? His plan was to gather up the demons, then then throw them against the wall where they'd burst 
in messy melody, curlicues of scraping sounds. But the demons had their own designs, as always. It's not as if they were primed to cooperate. They never had been before. Projections onto DreamWorks notwithstanding, Elliot always understood the enemy was within. It went where he went, everywhere from Home Depot to New Monkey. With tenacity, and with every last iota of self-preservative feeling he could muster, he'd defeated heroin and crack. The struggle now was with legal drugs, with psychiatry, his father's profession. Chiba recalls 90-minute sessions with Schloss, sometimes as frequently as three times per week. They worked away at his issues, but they also got sidetracked, discussing abstract math theories, among other recondite topics. What came to alarm Chiba, she says, was that nearly every day Elliot emerged with new prescriptions, even for laughably dubious diagnoses like restless leg syndrome. Chiba wound up purchasing the most complicated pill case you've ever seen, about the size of a human arm, with extra-large compartments. Once, when Chiba came along for a session, she asked Schloss pointedly, Why do you prescribe like this for someone with a drug habit? By this time, Elliot was spending upward of $7,000 per month, Chiba estimates, just on medication. Gary Smith had seen Elliot's man purse of drugs, and it shocked him too, Chiba recalls. Some nights she called Elliot's father in desperation. In many ways, as close friends had begun, had begun to realize over the span of several years, the psych meds were just as ruinous as the street variety. Elliot was chronically oversedated, his thinking soupy, his speech garbled. Several of his final 2003 performances were iffy affairs. He still seemed out of it. He was wobbly, his voice undependable, his playing imprecise. People speculated he was still on heroin, still a junkie. He wasn't. It was the psychiatric drugs. They were making him look like someone chronically mentally ill, slowed, sluggish, emotionally deadened, carelessly medicated. There were scant few performances in 2001 and 2002, the addiction years. They just weren't very possible. As he took to telling crowds, I'm too fucked up. In 2003, his pace picked up some as he tried to power through to get back on his feet. He played New York's Bowery Ballroom in late January, again stopping a few tunes. There were the two consecutive gigs at Henry Ford Theater in L.A. when Deeren showed up in disguise. In June, he appeared at the Field Day Festival held in New York's Giant Stadium. Dave Leto was there and spent time with Elliot backstage. As Leto recalls it, his mystique was still uniquely powerful. All the big stars and big bands, from Radiohead to Beck to Bright Eyes, watched him speechlessly from the wings as if studying a master. The day poured rain. It was Portland weather. Of a sort, Elliot felt at home with. But Toledo, although Elliot soldiered through the set, he was not exactly on his game. He looked different, for one. More ravaged than usual, more blurry. Parts appeared to be missing somehow, as if his personality had been turned off. After the show, Lido, Dorian, Chiba, and Elliot met up in his trailer. With Jennifer, Elliot was very touchy-feely, very PDA-ish. They seemed close, they seemed clearly bonded. Chiba and Dorian left, and Elliot told Lido he wanted to play him a song, a kinks tune called Days. Lido says, It was really cool. 
I felt pretty special. It was like a concert for one. This was a song Elliot had played many times for Chiba, telling her, You can listen to this when I'm gone. It's sort of a summing up, a melancholic thank you. I'm not frightened of this world, Davies writes. I won't forget a single day, even though the night is dark and brings more sorrow. As the year dragged on, the psych meds continued their destructive arc. There were far too many for one, at least six or seven. A newer antipsychotic, Zyprexa, now known to cause metabolic disorders. The Adderall, the Clonopin, Serzone, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor that worsens, in rare instances, suicidal thinking. There were days when Elliot took the proper dosages, abiding by his doctor's orders. Other times he manipulated the system, taking more than he should, hoping to disconnect himself, dampen the always intense emotional pain, hiding information from previous prescribers. Some he would see on his own at all hours of the night on mysterious errands. Back in 2002, he told McConnell about overdosing, how he'd been deliberately asleep, how he'd been deliberately reckless not caring what the effect might be. One night in 2003, he tried it again. This was to be the first in a handful of crisis evenings. Chiba discovered Elliot had taken 22 clonopin. His frighteningly blithe attitude seemed to be, let's just see if I die. Jennifer immediately called Ashley, who raced over, Chiba says, to find Elliot still conscious and propped up, but looking very slow and sedated. The idea, reasonably, was to call 911. But Elliot was adamantly opposed. They knew if they made the call, he'd find it unforgivable, more a betrayal than an honest attempt to get him the help he needed. Again, he feared cops, and in his paranoia expected the worst from any contact with authorities, even ambulance personnel. Essentially, his stance was to prevent us from, prevent us from preventing him from dying, Chiba recalls. So no call was made. But Elliot rose up awkwardly, with the intent of getting his car keys and driving away. Chiba and Ashley ordered him to lie back down, yet he kept totteringly trying to escape, insisting he was taking off. Chiba finally needed to physically block his path, and the two crashed to the floor on top of each other. Elliot was not trying to hurt her, but Chiba was hurt. She had hit her head, and Elliot bolted to the door. At this point, he had his car keys, and Ashley chased after him, determined not to let him get behind the wheel, apparently. As Chiba recalls it, Elliot finally agreed, after much discussion, to hand the keys over. Ashley wound up driving, the two staying in the car for several hours until slowly Elliot calmed down, became more lucid, the sedation clearing. Chiba was traumatized, concerned about possible injury. What remained was a feeling of helplessness. No one wanted to guess how much longer this could go on or what the final result might be. Once more, Chiba wondered whether she could take it. How was she going to make it through months, years, even a virtually uninterrupted emergency? Suicide had become a daily topic. Like the boy who cried wolf, Chiba says. It was almost a joke. Elliot might tell her, for instance, Today is the day they are going to put me down. Using almost comically a veterinary analogy. Chiba took it all in, feeling alone and spent, as did Ashley, who was nearby and on constant call. In one way, at least, all the suicide talk seemed geared to take the charge out of the subject, Chiba believed. 
She felt it was better in a sense for Elliot to be open about it, although the openness hardly diminished the fear everyone had. By August 2003, several developments merged, adding layers of complication to an already vexing situation. Around his 34th birthday, on August 6th, Elliot came to a monumental decision. He elected impulsively, and not entirely advisedly, from a medical or detox perspective, to go off everything, to try an immediate, total cold turkey. He stopped the psychiatric drugs, including a newer one, Stratera, for ADHD. It had been prescribed as an alternative to the more speedy Adderall. He also stopped smoking, drinking, caffeine, all of it. There was no tapering, no slow cessation of use. He just plain hit the brakes. Therapeutically, he began pounding kava, a drink with sedative properties, and a green concoction Chiba prepared a foul-tasting nutritional elixir. This seemed like a direction no one could argue with. He was getting clean, purging his system of every last toxin. But there was fallout, especially from the psychiatric drugs. His brain had become more sensitized from years of usage. Sudden cessation, therefore, came with added anxiety, moodiness, irritability, agitation. And the paranoia lingered around the edges, a renegade variable he now confronted with zero chemical assistance. He and Sheba took long walks in a canyon to promote activity and mindfulness. Elliot kept at the music, recording the Cat Stevens tune Trouble in their bedroom on a 24-track, it left him weeping, and the Bob Marley song Concrete Jungle. He was ragged, his nerves shot, walking on a wire, but he kept fighting. In this precariously drug-free state, his mind, both more lucid and more discombobulated, latched onto a terrifying, depressing circuit. It was a subject he'd actually been circling for some time, never sure what to make of it, never sure how much to believe, at once certain, at once thoroughly mystified. With Chiba, he had bought a book on the sexual abuse of young boys. He read it closely, underlining pages, making notes in the margins. Broadly, it matched his sense of his own history, of emotional pain, hypersensitivity, disconnection, fear. He'd lived in the same atmosphere of torment and anger. He decided, or suspected, or intuited, it's impossible to say, that he too might have been sexually abused. The realization hit him like a hammer blow. The implications were horrifying. There was the question of what to do about them, but suddenly in the light of this revelation, his agony found clarity. He figured, correctly or not, he might have some kind of answer now. The depression, the suicidal feelings, the self-abuse, it all made provisional sense at last. Everything he was in the process of uncovering, he shared instantly with Chiba. He even disclosed it to others, in her view, indiscriminately. It became all-consuming, something he needed to get out whenever and wherever he could. In his mind, as he dug through dim recollections, he seized on some sort of event in an attic. There was another that seemed to have occurred in a shower. He told me, Chiba says, as he got sober, all these horrific, shameful memories. But he also doubted their accuracy. He couldn't ever be sure. He'd speak, in one moment, with absolute certainty... Then he'd take it all back, saying, Actually, I don't think that happened at all. Chiba had worked with sexually abused kids. 
He asked me, she recalls, you've got to help me through this. Back in Portland, he'd made similar intimations. Then he'd identified someone outside his immediate family, a person with whom he'd only had sporadic contact. In any case, there seemed to be little way of knowing with certainty whether this was a false or a true memory. It was, no doubt, psychologically and emotionally real, its effects monumental, but what really happened, and who had been the abuser? On that subject, Elliot wavered. He was reluctant to name anyone. He was confused. He didn't trust his own memory. Yet finally, over days and weeks, and never without some trace of uncertainty, he seemed to settle on the likeliest possibility. The abuser he now suspected, rightly or wrongly, had been Charlie. It wasn't Elliot's plan at first to take this up directly. There was too much uncertainty, and the last thing he wanted was a confrontation. But as he did now and then, he called his mother, Bunny. She may have been in her classroom at the time, where she taught her. She may have been at home. She mentioned in passing that Charlie had been to school. She told Elliot the kids there had come to view him as one of the teachers. He'd been doing a lot of volunteering. On occasion, they ran to him to tattle on peers, a fact Bunny found funny since he wasn't technically a school employee. Hearing this, Elliot was alarmed. Two different ideas came to him suddenly. First, Cheever remembers, he had the paranoid sense that Charlie was planning to kill his mother. He felt he had to warn her. He had to protect her. Second, he insisted Charlie should not be around the kids. He wasn't to be trusted. By that, Bunny knew what Elliot meant. The connotation was sexual. He had asked her once before, Do you think Charlie ever sexually abused me? He told her he wasn't sure. He was trying to figure things out. Still, she was shocked. He'd never before made specific allegations, yet for the moment he seemed convinced. He was angry and adamant. And over the course of the conversation, he divulged everything, all the memories, veridical or reconstructed, he'd withheld before, of abuse generally and also of sexual abuse. Bunny's response was that she'd never observed anything, never seen anything suspicious. Elliot, however, insisted he needed to protect the children, to which Bunny suggested that perhaps he wasn't thinking straight, perhaps his mind was playing tricks on him. He'd gone off all drugs, after all, and he clearly wasn't in the best condition to accurately reach such conclusions. What she proposed was a meeting, a chance, she hoped, to set things straight. She and Charlie could come for Thanksgiving, to spend the holiday with Ashley and him, and the three of them could talk. This, Elliot found, terrifying, Chiba says. Not only was his mother skeptical, albeit possibly reasonably, in the circumstances, but he'd be put in the position of facing Charlie, a person he viewed with a mix of abject fear and contempt. In this swirl of emotional chaos, everything spinning off in several directions at once, Elliot fearful, guilty, uncertain, angry, and still intermittently paranoid, as always, there occurred still another frightening act of self-abuse. He and Chiba had planned to attend the film Lost in Translation. At the time, Elliot had been listening to My Bloody Valentine, the band's aesthetic, its crawling noise, and inspiration for the music he was working on. Five tunes by Kevin Shields, My Bloody Valentine's vocalist and guitarist, were featured in the film. Plus, Brian Reitzel, former drummer for the punk band Red Cross, had supervised the soundtrack, and Elliot was set to work with him on the movie Thumbsucker, for which he'd recorded Trouble. But at the last minute, Elliot decided not to go. He wanted to stay home and record. So, after some discussion, Chiba went alone. 
She thought it was odd, but there was no convincing Elliot otherwise. When she returned to the house... Excuse me. When she returned, the house was suspiciously dark. Elliot nowhere to be seen. She called, but there was no answer. At first, she assumed he wasn't home. Yet as she wandered anxiously room to room, she finally located him under the covers in bed, cowering and crying. She noticed a knife, then she saw blood in spots across the sheets. There were cuts, she saw, superficial ones at various points on his body. It was too much to take. Instantly, she thought, I can't do this anymore. I can't live with him. I need to break up with him. The ordeal of managing his day-to-day needs was seriously undermining her own mental stability. Again, she moved to call 911. Again, Elliot begged her not to. She asked, why, Elliot? It was a question everyone had been asking him nearly all his life. His answer was, I don't know. Chiba quickly contacted Ashley, and like always, she drove over immediately. For the next several days, Elliot wound up staying at Ashley's place, partly to give Chiba a break, partly to pull himself together. But this was the beginning of the end. His life was lived moment to moment. Okay, we're going to wrap it up there for today. I'll finish this chapter next time. Um, Really getting into the sad parts here. And as you'll notice, I haven't done any commentary. And we're going to keep it that way. So stay tuned. Thanks for listening.